Welcome to Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. I'm Andy Goldswag. I'm the director of the Cardiac Cath Lab at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, and associate editor of JSky. I'm honored to represent JSky and our editor-in-chief, Dr. Alexander Lansky. You can find us online at jsky.org, J-S-C-A-I.org, or on Twitter at, at myjsky, at M-Y-J-S-C-A-I. JSky is the home of all official Sky documents. Uh, we're here today to discuss an important recent official multi-society document published in JSky, the Sky HRS Expert Consensus Statement on Transcatheter Left Atrial Appendage Closure. We have an esteemed panel of internationally renowned experts with us today. Uh, first, Dr. Jacqueline Saw, Chair of the Writing Committee, is a Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of British Columbia and Program Director of the Vancouver General Hospital Interventional Cardiology Fellowship. We also have Dr. Matthew Price, uh, a member of the Writing Committee and Director of the Cardiac Cath Lab at Scripps Green Hospital in La Jolla, California. And we're joined by Dr. Faisal Merchant, who is a cardiac electrophysiologist and assistant professor at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you all for joining us. Let's get the conversation started. <laughs> I'm going to direct a question to Dr. Saw. First, congratulations on this uh, important multi-society document. Uh, this is really the first uh, such document in the field of left atrial appendage closure. Uh, a panel of 13 interventional cardiologists, electrophysiologists, and cardiac imaging experts developed a comprehensive document with 13 major recommendations. Uh, hopefully you can uh, quickly take us through the document uh, and summarize its most important points. I know you prepared some slides to share. Great, thank you so much, uh, Andy. Thanks for having me. And it's my pleasure to present on behalf of the writing committee. And there's actually 14 of us. Um, so as you mentioned, this is the Sky HRS expert consensus statement on transcatheter LAA closure. And um, so really this document provides the current evidence-based best practices for endovascular LAA closure by consensus of an expert panel with multi-societal support. And as you all know, the field of transcatheter endovascular LAA closure have really expanded in the past two decades. And the two previous uh, Sky documents that were published in 2015 and 2016 provided an overview of the technology and institutional and operator requirements, but not um, a broader perspective. And also since then, there's been two FDA approved devices. There's been several clinical trials and registries that have been published and uh, technical expertise and clinical practice and experience have matured over time. There's been new device iterations and imaging technologies that have evolved. And also there are many devices that are in clinical development. So therefore, Scott has prioritized the development of an updated consensus statement to provide recommendations on the contemporary evidence-based best practices for LA closure. So the writing group has been organized to ensure diversity of perspectives and demographics and multi-stakeholder and representation. So the literature searches were done and initial section drafts were authored by the section leads and revised by other writing group members. And the recommendations for each sections were um, discussed and agreed upon by all uh, the full writing group um, before uh, publication. So this document was structured to review key issues pertaining to um, these areas, patient selection for LA closure, um, physician and institutional requirements, uh, imaging recommendations, technical perspectives for safe and effective procedural performance, um, management recognition and avoidance of complications and post-procedural issues. And I'll take you through a summary of each of these recommendations uh, before discussion. So number one, patient selection for LA closure, transcatheter LAC is appropriate for non-valvular AF patients with high thromboembolic risk who are not suited for long-term oral anticoagulation and who have adequate life expectancy with minimum of one year and quality of life to benefit from LA closure. And there should be patient provider discussion for shared decision making. In terms of physician and institutional requirements, uh, we, we took this from the 2016 uh, recommendation where in terms of physicians' initial requirements, there should be at least 50 prior experience with structural procedures or left-sided ablation mm -hmm. procedure, and at least 25 experience uh, procedures with transeptal punctures. In terms of skill maintenance, maintenance will be at least 25 transeptal puncture and more than 12 LA closure over two years. And for institutional requirements, 
um, on-site cardiovascular surgical program backup is recommended during the implanter's early learning curve. In terms of imaging, for pre-procedural imaging, baseline imaging with TEE or cardiac CT is recommended before LA closure. In terms of uh, intra-procedural imaging, um, guidance is recommended with TEE or ICE, um, together with contrast angiography, uh, is strongly recommended. Fluoroscopy alone without TEE or ICE is not recommended. In terms of the techniques uh, for safe and effective procedure performance, um, each of these steps of procedural venous access, anticoagulation, transeptal puncture, delivery sheath, uh, selection and placement, device deployment, et cetera, should be performed in accordance with the testing and labeling for each specific LA closure device. In terms of complications, operators need to be familiar uh, with these complications, how to avoid, how to recognize and manage these complications mm -hmm. associated with LA closure. And post-procedure, pre-discharge imaging should be performed with a 2D echo to rule out pericardial fusion and device embolization before discharge. And same-day discharge um, is increasingly adopted nowadays, and it may be appropriate after several hours of observation demonstrating no complications or fusion post-LA closure. And for longer term issues in terms of post-procedure, uh, patients should be prescribed antithrombotic therapy with either warfarin, a DOAG, or dual antiplatelet therapy according to the study regimen and IFU for each specific device and tailored to the bleeding risk of each patient. TEE or cardiac CTA is recommended at 45 to 90 days post-LA closure for device surveillance to assess for peri-device leak and, and device-related thrombus. Um, but clinical impact and management of PDLs are not fully understood and all efforts should be made to minimize such leaks at the time of implantation. DRT or device-related thrombus should be treated with anticoagulation with repeat imaging at 45 to 90 days uh, intervals can be performed to assess for resolution uh, with eventual stopping of the anticoagulation. In terms of iatrogenic ASD, the routine closure uh, should not be performed or need, should not need to be performed with LA closure. And finally, with regards to combined procedures with LA closure, such as pulmonary vein ablation and other structural inventions like TAVI, uh, are not routinely recommended pending data from ongoing randomized con controlled trials. So these are a summary of the recommendations and I'll stop here for uh, more discussions. Wonderful, well, thank you very much, Dr. Saw. That's a, a fantastic set of recommendations uh, to, to guide the field and really a, a big leap forward in a field that uh, to this point, uh, has not had such guidelines. Uh, let me direct a question to Dr. Price. Uh, the consensus document recommended three phases of imaging for left atrial appendage closure. I think there were recommendations three, four, and five. A baseline imaging with TEE or CT, intraprocedural imaging with TEE or ICE, intracardiac echo, and then 45 to 90 day post-procedure imaging with TEE or CT. I'd like to ask your thoughts on uh, each of those imaging steps and particularly on the future of those imaging steps. Uh, whether you think pre-procedure imaging will always be mandatory, will ICE supplant TEE for inter-procedure imaging, and will post-procedure imaging at 45 to 90 days remain mandatory? Right. Well, let's start at the top. Let's first focus on baseline imaging. So the consensus recommendations is that all patients should get some sort of baseline pre-procedural imaging, either TE or, or CT. Now, baseline can mean the day of the procedure prior to venous sheath uh, introduction. So that does not mean that all patients need to have upstream imaging. So um, really, to look at it in a different way, fluoro-only implantation is not recommended. So, so um, and baseline imaging allows us to first rule out LA thrombus uh, at baseline, which is a key safety aspect. And then we believe allow us to um, both select the appropriate device and appropriate delivery sheath um, for that particular patient. So I think um, a very not controversial idea is that all patients should have some sort of baseline imaging and it would depend on the expertise of the local center and the operator, whether to do that upfront with CT or at the time with TE. Any thoughts on that, Andy, or in terms of baseline imaging? 
Oh. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think um, an early experience for operators um, where more challenging anatomy uh, may be encountered, um, if you have baseline imaging before they embark on the procedure, I, I think um, there will be um, benefits in terms of device selection or, or having assistance from um, clinical proctors, for instance. Um, so I think, you know, for uh, beginners for, for this device therapy, baseline imaging will be very helpful. Uh, for experts, I think, you know, doing on the same day, as long as you've ruled out thrombus, um, I, th I think that should be sufficient. But I would say that a, lo a lot of um, operators are just starting their, their um, experience in this uh, device therapy. And knowing if you're encountering a chicken wing anatomy, for instance, you know, um, having a pre-planning ahead of time uh, can be very helpful. 110% agree. Um, and I think the beauty of um, the guidelines that you, you led is that it allows individual application of both operator experience and also the um, access to care um, for patients. So um, if there, you can have a very good flow in your department with upstream CT or TE to set things up for each case and to be prepared for a complicated versus easy cases, particularly early in your experience with LA closure on this, other token in situations, for example, God forbid of a, a resurgence of, of a pandemic, COVID-19, there are ways where you can minimize early imaging to allow to get to the, the table and get the patients um, treated efficiently. So I think it needs to be applied for each operator, each institution, each community uh, best. But certainly all patients need to be screened the LA with thromb for thrombus before commencing the procedure. Ice imaging uh, becomes a more common phenomenon, though. Uh, is ice imaging, as your pre-procedure imaging, on the day of procedure, you know, 3D ice in the pulmonary artery to clear the appendage, uh, will that be adequate? Uh, one challenge that remains there is if you're using pre-procedure imaging to select which of the two approved devices you're going to use, uh, and like many institutions, you have a representative from the company present, uh, you're going to need uh, to figure out how you're deciding uh, which representative to have present uh, without knowing the patient's anatomy. So that's a sort of yeah. limitation there. So in regards to ice, that was, that's a good segue to the next question you had, which was intra-procedural imaging, because I think the type of intra-procedural imaging you choose very well impacts the type of baseline or pre-procedural imaging you will pursue. So um, I think currently I would say that the consensus or the, the general community standard is TE guidance during LA closure. If you look at the NCDR registry, that, that, that the data there supports that and that the overwhelming majority of cases currently are guided by TE. So um, in terms of intracardiac echocardiography, I believe, and we didn't address this that much in the guidelines because it, it is a moving target, I believe that Upstream imaging before you get into the lab itself is critical. Generally, I, I do CT imaging, but again, that is operator dependent and based on their hospital uh, and division capabilities. But certainly um, having, before you introduce the ice catheter into the patient, having a knowledge of the image of the LA diameters, shape and overall plan would be critical. So, um, I think that addresses your second question. Mm -hmm. you may remind me of your second question again, please. Yeah, no, that's perfect. The uh, the future of intraprocedural imaging, whether ICE will supplant PE. Well, I I don't. I think it is certainly there are some potential advantages with intraprocedural intracardiac echo that could benefit both the patient, the operator and in fact, the hospital. And with the development of new ICE technologies, in specific 3D ICE, where you can get TE-like multiplanar imaging and 3D imaging and MPR, that allows um, a, I think, a more efficient and accurate and less arduous procedure with ICE. That being said, there still needs to be an increased communal knowledge and shared knowledge of the appropriate best practices for ice-guided LA occlusion. And 
as a community, I think Jackie and others, myself and others, we're, we're all working on, on this. I, I do think that this is my personal um, a formal sky um, opinion, but I do think that you should be very comfortable with traditional TE imaging to implant LA devices before you proceed with ice imaging. I do think that 3D imaging will supplant 2D imaging, but there are some cost issues. Certainly, I think patients prefer not to have a TE probe and there may be flow benefits for the hospital. We're not there yet. I think, and Jackie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think in the latest SDR data set, about 8 to 10% of cases are being done by intracardiac echo guidance. I suspect that will increase, but I don't, I don't expect it to supplant um, all, um, all, all cases. Certainly, I think we'll see, again, as more and more people do or get familiar with 3D ice, share their knowledge, share their tips and tricks, come up with good guidelines of how we really define the appropriate implants on ice, since historically they were defined by TE for, for the different devices we have available to us. So I think ICE is a work in progress. Very exciting. We're not there quite yet. I agree. I think we're limited currently by the uh, imaging that we can acquire with ICE is, is sometimes suboptimal compared to TEs. Clearly, TE procedural guidance is superior compared to ICE. And I think when we have better technology with um, better depth of field, for instance, and if you can just keep the ice on the right side rather than having to put it into the left atrial side, obviously there's complexity um, to the procedure trying to access the left atrium with the ice probe itself. So, um, you, you know, the, these are the, those issues that's on top of imaging um, capability um, before ice could supplant TE. Currently, I think, um, yeah, you're, I think you're right. You know, that's our experience as well. It's roughly about 10% of cases where we're using ice uh, just because TEE, the imaging is so much better compared to ice. I think it's a great discussion for a whole other sky. Um, we're doing about, I'm doing about 90% 3D ice guided. So I, I, but I think we're not there yet to say you should be doing 3D ice instead of TE, not even close. Uh, Faisal, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah, the only comment I was going to make, actually, I think you guys have covered all the salient points, but particularly for early operators, early in your experience, I think it's ET is probably the way to start. You really got to, you know, having another operator there, not having to worry about manipulating the ice probe. For all those reasons, early in experience, I think TE is the way to go. Couldn't say it better myself. Um, it's certainly LAO 2.0 would be uh, intracardiac echo or 201. So your last question, Andy, was about the future of post-procedural imaging, I think. And um, you saw already in the consensus documents a little bit different than what was done in the clinical trials. We gave a, although there was a window, of course, in the clinical trials, but we generally performed TE follow-up at 45 days with some window. And the guidelines give a window of 45 to 90 days and also TE or CT. I think that's in response to continued data supporting both CT imaging during follow-up and also changing and changes in post-procedural management of these patients. So the question is whether A is what is the appropriate time frame to check or do we even need to do post-procedural imaging? And second is um, what type of imaging? And third is what does the future hold? Well, I, I would say this, I, I think certainly there is increasing support for CT scanning over time. We haven't adopted that routinely here because there's also infrastructure burdens for CT scan time here. Um, there's also, I think, going to be a lot of data coming out with the trials of both our devices, whether it's the Champion AF trial or the Catalyst trial, looking at different types of both pharmacological and also imaging follow-up. Um, and that will give us real data of what to do because I, I don't. we have data for 45 days. We don't have great randomized data for, for other data points. Then finally, I would say is what are we looking for when we're doing post-procedural imaging is really three things. You, you hit that, Jackie, at the beginning was um, device-related thrombus, peri-device leak. And I would say also a corollary shifting of the device. The device is not where you thought you had left it. But all three of those things are extraordinarily rare and getting rare or more uncommon as 
techniques evolve and technologies evolve. So um, there's going to come a time where the sort of number needed to detect a problem is going to get very high. And the question is whether it's even worth doing. I don't think we're there yet. Again, I think data from the large champion and catalyst trials, we have thousands of patients getting follow-up. What are really the, the DRT rates in modern practice? What are the implications of PDL? Um, so a lot of unknowns. Uh, I would say, I mean, my practice is still sort of original from the trials in the 45 days I do, irrespective of the device, I will be doing it at TE and then also at, at one year. Um, and there's a lot of arguments to move away from that. I'd love to hear what the, the others on the, on the panel have to say. Well, I was going to say, we've largely moved away from the one year TE, but still do the 45-ish day, um, which is, you know, it's, I think we need to learn more. Obviously, you see a different distribution of leaks. The sizes that you pick up by CT are different than TE, but we're still largely extrapolating our management based on, you know, what we learned about leaks in the original trials from TE. So whether or not the same is relevant for a leak uh, detected by CE, uh, CT, I think, you know, we clearly need to know more about. I think a lot of operators talk about uh, an important natural experiment that occurred uh, in the spring and summer of 2000. Right, that uh, there were a certain number of people out there who had left atrial appendage devices implanted, uh, and then hospitals said that we weren't going to do TE anymore. Right, and uh, many people, I can say, certainly uh, what we did at, at my institution, uh, we stopped people's uh, anticoagulation, put them on dual antiplatelet therapy at the 45 day mark, as we always did, uh, because quite frankly, we had so few patients who, whose 45 day TEs changed management. Uh, right. Now. It's uh, obviously just an anecdotal experience, uh, and uh, so I, I can't say uh, a ton based on that. I think, uh, Dr. Price, you're 100% right that uh, the data from Champion AF and Catalyst, just the large numbers of patients uh, having TEs at those time points, will give, give us a better sense what the PDL and uh, DRT rates really are. But uh, I think a lot of people have uh, kind of cautiously started to back off a little on their follow-up imaging. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the, the reason we're quite flexible, more flexible in the document saying it's 45 days and 90 days as well, because a lot of us feel that, you know, your more dominant or strongest regimen was, you know, either DAPT or OAC for a month or to 45 days. And is when you stop these agents that you would develop DRT. So that's why some delay to 90 days. So we gave the flexibility and, and absolutely agree that a lot of institutions and operators actually stopped doing the one year imaging. But I still think there is merits for patients where there is presence of PDL at 45 days or you're concerned about DRT. These are the individuals that you might then do the one year um, repeat imaging. Let me direct a question to Dr. Merchant here. As the, uh, as the electrophysiologist in the room, uh, you care for a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, the document recommends left atrial appendage closure for non-valvular AFib patients who are quote unquote uh, not suited for long-term oral anticoagulation. Uh, and that's consistent with the uh, device approval. Now, we've seen evolution over time, the types of patients undergoing left atrial appendage closure. I wonder if you could comment on what you see as the role of left atrial appendage closure in the management of AFib today and how you see that role evolving in the future. Yeah, you know, I think there are probably, you can answer that question at two ends of the spectrum. The one end of the spectrum is, Atrial fibrillation is obviously a burgeoning epidemic, but it's an epidemic that's driven in large part by age and comorbidity. And there are a lot of individuals who, as they get older, are going to develop atrial fibrillation, develop comorbidities. Many of them will eventually likely not be good anticoagulation candidates. But I don't think you can make the argument that all of them or even most of them should undergo an invasive procedure for which, you know, you've got to have sufficient survival in order to see benefit from undergoing the procedure. And I thought the the document writers, Dr. Saad and Dr. Price and others, did a great job of outlining some of that in the document, but also making that recommendation. It's actually recommendation number one that you should have a reasonable expectancy of life uh, of life expectancy more than a year. That's a little bit like what we've been doing in the EP world for many years now with primary prevention defibrillators. Now it's not always easy to judge one year survival. We're probably pretty bad at it, but just the notion that you've got to survive long enough to benefit from an invasive procedure. I think is an important one. And really patient selection, I think is key as it is with any invasive procedure. On the other end of the spectrum are the relatively younger, healthier patients. And 
as we've already alluded to with champion and catalyst, I think we're going to get more data on people at average bleeding risk, particularly head to head with uh, novel anticoagulants. And that I think will really potentially fundamentally change the landscape of management once we get data from those trials. So we're not there yet, but hopefully we'll have more data soon. Fantastic. Well, Champion has completed enrollment last November, three year follow up, uh, and Catalyst is still working on enrollment. So if you're at a Catalyst Center, uh, keep enrolling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Saw, Dr. Price, Dr. Merchant. We're thrilled to include this important paper uh, in the eighth issue of JSky and to share the discussion with this incredible panel. Uh, please follow us, uh, follow JSky online uh, at jsky.org, on Twitter at, at myjsky, and submit your own work to JSky. JSky is the official journal of the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions. Thank you all very much. See you next time.